Oh, hello. <laughs> Recording in progress. Hello, everybody. My name is Dr. Kat Scafidi, and I want to welcome you all to a faculty roundtable here at the College of Public Health. And the topic is on violence prevention research, uh, violence being a huge issue, a uh, public health issue um, that is across across the globe. And so we're excited that within our college, we have a number of faculty who are engaged in re different types of research that specifically address violence prevention. So um, no further ado, let me um, share with you the names of our panelists today. Uh, we have Denise Hines, who's Associate Professor in the Department of Social Work. And feel free to wave if you if, when I call your name. <laughs> uh, Dr. Karen uh, Grace, who is assistant professor in the School of Nursing. Jumka Gupta, uh, uh, Dr. I should say Dr. Jumka Gupta, the associate professor in the Department of Global and Community Health. Da Dr. Daphne King, assistant professor of the Department of Social Work, who I believe hopefully can be here today. Um, she may have had a conflict, so we're going to keep our eyes open for her. And of course, and there's myself. So uh, just to let you guys know, we had a wonderful PhD uh, doctoral student within global and community health um, who was going to moderate this panel today. Unfortunately, she fell ill. So I am serving as both your moderator and panelist. So, so let's get started. So this is a question. Um, we're going to start off with a question for all the panelists to answer. And then we have some individual questions. Uh, to help uh, take a deeper dive into our areas of focus. Um, we're going to wrap it up with some uh, more questions for all of our panelists, but then we're going to open the floor to you all to ask us questions, um, and uh, specifically around the areas of violence prevention. So, uh, so let's get started. So the question I'm going to pose to you all, and we're going to start with uh, Dr. Hines, is tell us about a little bit about the work that you do um, and how it contributes to violence prevention. So go for it. Thank you, Dr. Scafidi. So um, I have been doing work on interpersonal violence uh, for about 20 years now. And the kind of scope of my work focuses on uh, causes and consequences um, of different forms of interpersonal violence. I do a lot of work on sexual assault, on intimate partner violence. Um, and I also do a lot of work on sort of groups that are not typically thought about when um, thinking about issues of sexual assault and um, intimate partner violence. We'll talk about that a little bit later, I think. Um, but I did for seven years um, at my prior institution, I co-founded and co-directed um, a violence prevention program on our college campus that focused on um, sexual assault, intimate partner violence, and stalking prevention among college students. So it was on our particular campus. And then um, about four years into the grant funding, we expanded it to three other area colleges. Um, and we did what was called a bystander prevention program. And so we um, we took all incoming students at all of the area colleges and put them through what was called the bringing in the bystander program where we taught students how to recognize sort of early warning signs um, that a sexual assault or an act of intimate partner violence or stalking behavior might be occurring and how to appropriately and safely intervene both before during and after um, instances of partner violence um, and we evaluated this uh, program. And what we did see were reductions in um, sexual assault and partner violence on our campus um, within two years of starting the program. Um, and the rates kind of nosedived and then went back up a little bit and plateaued, but never reached you know, baseline levels. Um, and we also saw that our program really did change people's attitudes and behaviors and motivated them to intervene when they saw something kind of suspicious happening that could uh, result in sexual assault, partner violence, um, or stalking. Um, and we also worked with university officials on um, helping to change and improve our policies and procedures and judicial policies regarding um, those different types of partner violence. And so um, that 
uh, it just adds to the body of work on violence prevention among college students um, and allows us to think about how can we take this work and apply it in other contexts. Um, and I'll turn it over to whoever is next in the Thank you. session. And I uh, would love to hear from uh, Dr. Uh, Karen Grace. Thank you. Um, nice to see uh, so many people here at this webinar today, and thanks for having me. Um, so my, my background, my professional background is that I am a nurse midwife. Um, I've practiced as a midwife for 22 years. Um, and then kind of later in my career, I went back to school for my PhD um, and started a research career. So I was really fortunate to have the opportunity to um, do my PhD with some of the really like the top scholars in the field of violence research, um, Jackie Campbell, Nancy Glass, um, Michelle Decker, um, up at Johns Hopkins. Um, and I worked with Dr. Nancy Glass on her uh, My Plan study, which is um, My Plan is an app. Um, so it's like a decision aid for people who are in abusive relationships um, to help them sort of clarify their priorities um, and make a safety plan. And it's also for um, the study that I worked on, we were sort of expanding it to, um, to be for friends of people who are in abusive relationships. So um, similar to the bystander work that Dr. Hines was talking about, um, so it's designed for friends to help them sort of figure out how to help their friends. Um, so that's sort of how I got my start in violence research. And then um, also in my doctoral studies, I began studying reproductive coercion. Um, <clears throat> so reproductive coercion for anyone who is not aware is um, kind of a, a component of intimate partner violence. It's abusive or controlling behavior um, that interferes with reproductive health decision making um, by people who are capable of pregnancy. Um, so it can con consist of um, a number of different types of behaviors. It can consist of pregnancy pressure. Um, so pressure um, on a partner to get pregnant when they don't necessarily want to be pregnant. Um, it can consist of birth control sabotage. So things like poking holes in condoms, throwing away birth control pills, um, could be forcibly removing an IUD or a contraceptive ring. Um, it could be preventing access to contraception. So um, preventing someone from getting to a clinic appointment to get contraception. And then the third component of reproductive coercion is controlling the outcome of a pregnancy. So that could be either um, coercing someone to have an abortion when they want to continue the pregnancy, or the flip side of that, coercing someone to continue a pregnancy or blocking access to abortion when the person wants to terminate the pregnancy. So all of that is um, it makes up reproductive coercion, which has been kind of the bulk of my um, research in my doctoral studies, as well as in my um, kind of junior faculty career here at George Mason. Um, so in my research, I have looked at risk factors for reproductive coercion um, and also looked at the impact of RC or reproductive coercion on um, unintended pregnancy and kind of the combined or synergistic effect of um, intimate partner violence, physical violence, along with um, behaviors of reproductive coercion on unintended pregnancy. Um, also in terms of um, getting a little closer to the prevention side of what we're talking about, um, I have done some work looking at safety strategies. Um, so um, what are the things that people do to kind of preserve their autonomy, their reproductive autonomy when they're facing reproductive coercion? Um, in some of my work, we have um, found in qualitative work, people have described um, the use of like lies and deception um, as a way of kind of avoiding um, the coercive behaviors that they're experiencing. Um, 
we have seen people talk about um, covert use of birth control. So use of methods of birth control that um, the partner isn't aware that they are using. So often that's like an IUD or an injectable method. Um, also, um, um, the much sort of simpler technique of simply ending the relationship is another strategy that people use. Um, and some people also use abortion as a means of kind of getting out of a bad relationship, um, separating from an abusive partner. And I also have looked really at how these, um, what people are actually doing in terms of safety strategies kind of meshes with the, the official guidelines for clinicians. So there are recommendations for clinicians who see patients who are experiencing reproductive coercion um, that we suggest to them these less detectable methods of birth control, IUDs, injectable methods, um, and also less detectable methods of abortion. So for some people, um, a medical abortion might be a safer option um, because it does sort of mimic a spontaneous abortion or a miscarriage. Um, so, so that's my, my, um, my background and I'll hand it over to the next person. Great, thank you. Um, next person up is Dr. Jumka Gupta. Hi everyone, uh, thanks for coming, especially the students, because from what I hear, it's a particularly busy time in the semester, so we appreciate your attending. So um, before I get into my violence work, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about my discipline. So I am what you call a social epidemiologist. So what that means is I study social and structural factors such as you know, discrimination, um, you know, gender-based discrimination, other types of societal discrimination, power, um, immigration policy, and how these um, large macro level things impact health inequity. And in my particular case, how these things impact the distribution of uh, intimate partner violence or violence against women and girls. And um, I started out my career looking uh, more, you know, traditional risk and protective factors, but also um, have done interventions to mitigate the um, harmful health impacts of violence against women and girls, and as well as prevention interventions to prevent this from happening to begin with. And in addition to intimate partner violence, I've also done research on other types of violence, such as uh, sex trafficking as well, um, as it relates to HIV and mental health. And um, I specifically, you know, when I started this research as a doctoral student, I kind of came into a doctoral program um, fresh off of escaping a coup in Haiti, where I was for a year prior to my doctoral work. And um, what really struck me was there was a lot of uh, focus on the hospital system I was working with in getting the communities ready um, to respond to the health impacts of this very large public form of violence, like civil conflict. But when it came to like the more private forms, such as the women who were showing up being stabbed by a partner or things like that. It was just like, okay, well, we'll just send her home because we don't really have anything for her. So that was less talked about. And so I became very interested in the interplay between um, violent conflict or humanitarian crises and how that impacts um, private forms of violence, um, specifically intimate partner violence. And at the time, there really wasn't a lot of work going on in that arena. So I had the opportunity to build that work um, as part of my dissertation, really looking at immigrant communities in the US and exposure to political conflict in their countries of origin and how that impacted um, intimate partner violence in the US. And since then, um, you know, building the research base around that in terms of epidemiology, but also interventions. And um, although I was trained as an epidemiologist, I think as most people who work in the IPV field, I've quickly 
understood that given the ethics and the um, the marginalization experienced by many of the populations that I work with um, and the stigma that mixed methods work was necessary, both qualitative and quant, and also moving towards interventions. So now I will hand it over to, I guess, the next question. <laughs> so yeah, or no, actually Dr. Scafidi. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and so I'm going to just do a quick look. I don't think we have Dr. King with us today, so I will take the question next. So um, myself, I my background is as a forensic nurse. And so a forensic nurse is a nurse who has received specialized training to work with patients who will likely interact with the legal system. Um, and with a large focus heavily on um, patients who re report experiencing violence. So I have a long history of working with patients um, who uh, reported acute physical trauma, um, sexual assault, intimate partner violence, child abuse, child sexual abuse, um, intimate, uh, I said intimate partner violence, uh, elder maltreatment, human trafficking, uh, it, just to name a few. <laughs> and, uh, but I was always fascinated by the stories that their injuries would tell. Um, and so injuries can tell you a lot about what um, a patient has experienced uh, in terms of uh, the, uh, the trauma. Uh, and I was fascinated with, you know, this story and how I could as a researcher um, best explore that and, and provide more information in order to be able to assure that uh, patients who experience violence can get the best treatment they can. I also witnessed an incredible um, inequities in how injuries are able to be identified and documented on um, victims of violence, particularly those who have dark skin pigmentation. So as you all know, bruises are hard to see on people who have dark skin tone um, because the pigmentation sits above the area where the bleeding occurs um, as a result of the, um, the blunt force trauma. So my research really helps address secondary prevention, that acute phase when patients are, um, um, are being seen um, after the event. So I have focused on identifying technology, specifically something called an alternate light source, uh, which can help improve our detection of bruises across um, diverse skin tones. Uh, I've also been working with uh, engineering to um, use AI technology in order to try to um, provide more information um, about uh, bruises in terms of being able to predict their age and, and other information, which can really help these particular patients, um, you know, it, as they navigate not just the criminal justice system, because I think that's what oftentimes we think about when it comes to forensics, but also assuring that they get the healthcare resources that they need. Um, for example, oftentimes strangulation is, is missed um, because injuries to the neck are very difficult to see um, due to the elasticity of the neck and the, um, the structures you know, beneath the skin. It, it doesn't support bruising very well. And if we can't detect strangulation related injuries, those particular patients may not receive the care that they need in order to determine if they're gonna develop more insidious effects of strangulation. Um, so it's, it's, an, it's an essential um, part of uh, a, you know, a forensic nurse's role is to work with uh, patients who report violence and, and help make sure we can provide them the best care possible. So, and, and anyway, so that's, that's my uh, research in a nutshell. Um, and uh, I, I can, I've seen a couple times people raise their hands and things like that. We're gonna save questions till the end of the, um, of our presentation. So uh, next up, we're gonna do some specific questions for specific people. Um, so Denise, Dr. Hines, let's start with you. So you've had lots of experience with violence prevention programs on college campuses. What did you learn from those experience about strengths and gaps in what we are currently doing? 
this is particularly relevant given the fact we're at George Mason, so. Yes. So there are um, some really good prevention programs out there for college students, I have to say. Um, there are some that are, the one that I did was in person and I also facilitated some online prevention programs. And there is a lot of research backing up that, so this bystander approach is actually quite effective in um, helping people sort, sort of create a culture on campus where violence, sexual assault, intimate partner violence, stalking is not accepted. And that, that dissuades perpetration in the first place. Um, there are a lot of gaps, you know, having done, done this work for, for quite a long time, um, I can think of several gaps. I think the, the main one is that it's already too late, right? So I had conversations with incoming students saying, thank you for doing this. No one's ever talked with us about this before. And we also had a lot of data that showed that at least a quarter of our students coming into campus already had experience with sexual assault, never mind the other forms of violence that we were assessing. And so it's too late. They should be having these conversations, these prevention programs a lot sooner than we're already do than we're doing it on college campuses. I think it's great that we're addressing it on college campuses, but it needs to be something that's infused in the K through 12 curriculum um, at developmentally appropriate uh, with developmentally appropriate uh, conversations. So that's that's kids learn of um, you know, appropriate ways to interact, consent. Consent can be taught from the moment they, uh, the moment they're born, you can teach consent um, in developmentally appropriate ways. And so these conversations need to be had in their schooling from the very beginning. Um, and I think along with that, you know, we had, we were a pretty comprehensive program in comparison to other places. And we really only had an hour and a half with students. And so the effects just don't last, right? Um, and they're also getting our program, at the time they're getting alcohol prevention programs and um, you know how to, how to navigate the, the blackboard system at their school. And you know, they're getting all of this all at the same time when they're being overwhelmed with information as incoming students. And so it gets easily forgotten and watered down. And so we need more curriculum and the curriculum needs to just be ongoing and scaffolded and built upon itself. Um, and the other thing, uh, another thing that is sort of a weakness in our prevention programs is that they're very heteronormative. And, you know, we made specific efforts in our prevention program to, to move away from, you know, these are things that only men do to only women. Um, and we would have role plays and scenarios with different gender and sexual orientation sort of configurations of who's doing what in which scenario. And um, our students didn't, it didn't ring, it, it didn't, um, they didn't seem to, to dispel any stereotypes. They come into the program thinking, oh, sexual assault, that's what men do to women. Uh, dating violence, that's what men do to women. And our program deliberately said, no, it's not just that. Uh, it happens in these in other relationships as well, in other ways. And they never really uh, internalized that material to the point where we actually had a group of students um, come to us when they were sophomores and said, you have this prevention program. It's too heteronormative. We, would, we want to infuse um, LGBTQ relationships into it. And, and we said, great, you know, we would love your input here, take it and do it. Here's our program manual. And they looked at it and they said, oh, you already have that. And I, we said, well, yeah, but it's not remembered because we only have an hour and a half with you. And it's so hard to dispel stereotypes 
within just an hour and a half. And so although these programs are great, they're too brief and they're not frequent. Um, and so we really, really need to be doing a lot better job, a, a, a much better job of engaging in violence prevention from the moment kids enter schools through the moment that they graduate. Wonderful, thank you, Dr. Hines. And Dr. Grace, so your area of research, reproductive coercion, which we, we heard a lot about, uh, seems very timely given the recent Supreme Court decision overturning Roe versus Wade. What do you think will be the impact of this decision for women experiencing reproductive coercion? Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I, I almost wish that we were just sort of having a, a conversation, an open conversation, because I also want to, like, there's so much that Dr. Hines just talked about that I wanted to <laughs> um, engage in conversation on as well. So I just want to quickly say that I think it's so important to be doing this work, all of this work on college campuses. And um, I hate to keep throwing this person under the bus, but um, I always tell the story about a, a colleague of mine who, um, when I was talking about the work that I've done looking at reproductive coercion in college students, which um, I've done in, in two different areas, um, two different uh, universities. Um, and uh, when I was mentioning that, she said, really? I thought college students were, were too smart for that. Um, and so it's really, um, I feel terrible that I keep that I keep mentioning her when I'm trying to illustrate um, this point, but um, definitely I think it's the case that um, this is a super relevant issue, intimate partner violence, reproductive coercion, it all happens to college students, happens on college campuses, so I'm really glad that we're having this conversation. Um, but in relation to the, um, the Roe v. Wade um, uh, overturning, um, this is absolutely something that I've been asked about um, numerous times since um, last spring when this all kind of went down. Um, and it's sort of, um, yeah, it's, it's a really important question, a really important um, discussion to be having. Um, so as I was talking about um, previously, um, for a lot of people, um, abortion is really a way to um, people use abortion to, in order to separate from an abusive partner, in order to end an abusive relationship, in order to avoid having children with someone who is abusing them. Um, so it's a really essential safety strategy um, and a way to kind of keep from being tied to that abusive person um, basically for the next 18 or so years. So um, the fact that that now so many people in this country are being denied abortion, I think really um, undermines kind of fundamental rights for everyone who's seeking this kind of health care. Um, and not having access to abortion really represents um, a really unique risk for ongoing violence for people who have abusive partners. Um, sort of moving beyond just um, the kind of interpersonal reproductive coercion that I look at in my research. I think it also, this decision, the Dobbs decision um, that, repe that, that repealed um, Roe v. Wade kind of sets up a precedent, I think, of um, government control over people's bodies. So right now it's people who want to end a pregnancy, but what about um, in the future? What if the government decides certain people have had too many children? Um, it kind of starts us, I think, on a path towards um, coerced contraception, coerced sterilization. Also, I think there are implications for um, people who are transgender, that the government can kind of intercede and, and make decisions about their physical body and their identity. Um, so really far reaching effects of all of this. At the same time, you know, what I study in reproductive coercion is, um, is behaviors by a partner, um, but there's so many levels of reproductive coercion. Um, and so there's, there's other, so first of all, there's other people besides uh, a sexual partner who perpetrate uh, RC behaviors. Um, in the international literature, more often than the domestic literature, we see things like 
um, relatives and in-laws who are perpetrating these um, reproductive coercion behaviors. But then there's a whole nother kind of level of sort of state and federal governments um, perpetrating reproductive coercion. So whether it's um, the kind of history of forced sterilizations, um, sterilizations being performed without consent, primarily on communities of color, um, the testing of um, high dose oral contraceptives, um, also on communities of color. Um, so all of those things are, are, you know, sort of tied, I think, together with this. Um, you know, before before the Dobbs decision, before this, the Roe v. Wade um, was overturned, um, there were already so many sort of restrictions on abortion in terms of rules about waiting periods, um, rules about um, in, in certain states um, that about women having to view an ultrasound perhaps um, before having an abortion, um, forcing healthcare providers in some states to provide inaccurate counseling on things like fetal pain, fetal heartbeat. Um, and really limited abortion availability um, in huge areas of the country already. So, um, so I don't want to I I don't want to kind of think of um, what happened last June as being like um, you know the huge the 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 be all and end all game changer. I think it has been sort of an eroding um, landscape of of reproductive. Um, reproductive rights in this country for a while. Um, and, you know, my, my area of research also kind of expands into um, contraceptive coercion as well. So there's something, um, this, there's a lot of literature now looking at um, sort of over-enthusiastic providers in pushing certain methods of birth control. Um, like uh, IUDs, like sterilization, um, refusing to remove IUDs when a patient requests that the IUD be removed, um, coercing sterilization, but also refusing sterilization for some people. So um, all of this just, it's just all ties together, I think, in terms of um, sort of the, the larger landscape of reproductive autonomy. I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Dr. Grace and Dr. Jeffka Gupta. So your focus has been with crisis affected settings um, in the global South. Um, and so what do you think the US can learn from uh, intimate partner violence prevention, both interventions and research conducted in this particular area? Yeah, sure. So, um, so I just wanted to talk a little bit about uh, what I mean by a crisis affected setting. So I mean, like, affected by some kind of humanitarian crisis, whether it's war or um, a natural um, hazard or disaster, or um, as we've all, you know, witnessed, like, um, pandemics or anything of that nature. So um, often what's also characterized be, by these settings is um, forced displacement. Um, some are refugees, but you can be forcibly displaced without necessarily being a refugee. Um, and um, what we've learned is these types of settings um, have certain uh, characteristics that can make uh, communities vulnerable to intimate partner violence and um, particularly because of forced displacement, um, you know, obviously you're, you know, attenuating a, a support network that one is used to. So separation from that type of support network, there is, you know, a loss of income, the mental stress and trauma. And also uh, what we often see is, um, you know, this, you know, a role reversal um, with gender roles where, you know, following a crisis, uh, women may actually have more opportunities to um, bring in an income that they may not have had before um, because of, um, you know, post-crisis um, interventions and buildup, whereas there's a general loss of income or loss of social status that men experience. And so that has been the focus of a lot of my research, um, because 
the the general or you know the traditional way to approach this was you know if we provide access to income to women and households through um, you know microfinance or you know some type of microcredit program, then a woman can have access to financial resources that she may not have had before, and that can um, and that can um, reduce partner violence. But the other side of it, and in learning and partnering with um, humanitarian organizations that work on these issues on the ground, is that what we often, uh, what communities often experience is also backlash because suddenly the woman does have more access to finances and is able to assert herself more, whereas there's a loss of status. So that can lead to a backlash and actually increase partner violence in such settings. So one of the interventions that I spent a lot of my time on is called EASE, which is Economic and Social Empowerment Interventions, where um, women were um, put into groups called Village Savings and Loans Association, where they did group-based um, um, savings. So it was an access to more financial resources for the household. But what we also did was uh, bring in male partners or those out, another um, head of the household to actually talk about how to best use such resources um, in a way that is best for the household as a whole, um, how to make um, decisions about finances and household decision making in an equitable manner, how to um, how to negotiate and things like that. So what we're really trying to get at is gender equity through a financial lens with um, with male partners as well. So that intervention was funded by uh, the World Bank and we did a large-scale randomized controlled trial in villages in Cote d'Ivoire in West Africa and what we found was that um, we did reduce uh, physical intimate partner violence um, and economic intimate partner violence and also um, reduced acceptance of intimate partner violence as a way to handle conflict and we also found, um, particularly with men, was um, discussions around um, um, access to a social support network that they didn't have otherwise, which also improved mental health as well. And they were able to reinforce those messages. And I think that um, back to your original question, which is um, what can the US learn? Well, I think number one, I think um, funders and donors such as the World Bank and other international development organizations such as DFID, which is the UK's equivalent of USAID, there's just a lot more um, flexibility and opportunity for creativity and to really bring in this multi-sectoral approach to violence prevention um, that's outside of the health clinic um, and um, really can engage like the financial sector, the development sector, and other things to really address the multifaceted um, problem that violence is. And, um, you know, what I would like to see in the U.S. is similar types of approaches um, and I think that's starting, uh, we were funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation actually to see how we can adapt ease for um, forcibly displaced and refugee communities that have resettled in the US because they have very similar experiences. And um, traditionally in the US, the interventions for partner violence are much more service oriented. Um, in the health sector, but really focusing in on the economic sector, the work sector, um, the immigration sector. So um, really getting at that public health 3.0 approach um, is what I think the U.S. can learn. And I think that's particularly important, um, you know, as we are still, um, you know, experiencing um, the fallout of the pandemic that was you know, a lot of communities in the U.S. experience very similar things, cut off from social support, 
loss of finances, um, the isolation and, um, you know, loss of income. So, you know, how can we think about intervening using models from the global South that have a lot of experience on these issues? So I think I'll leave it at that for now. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Gupta. Um, so we will um, scoot past uh, Dr. King and the nurse myself. There's a question. And um, so, like I said, I'm a forensic nurse. So the question was, what role does forensic nursing play in the public health response to violence and why is it so important? And I think I alluded to a lot of this earlier in my uh, dis discussion around my own research, but uh, forensic nurses play a crucial role in secondary prevention. They're often a first um, line of response to um, uh, victims who are seeking care uh, as a result of their injuries. Um, and, uh, you know, they, um, not only do they address the, uh, the impact of their physical injuries, but they also um, are essential in addressing the immediate crisis response that they're experiencing um, uh, mentally. So uh, they help uh, provide them the tools that they need, the referrals, the care, uh, the medications, um, to address um, a lot of their injuries that they have in that immediate acute stage and hopefully set them up for um, success um, in their long-term uh, recovery uh, from the experience. So uh, in a variety of scenarios, um, you see forensic nurses um, deployed in, um, you know, they're in clinics, they're in hospitals, they're in corrections, they're on um, military um, units in um, vessels around the world. The uh, forensic nurses are in a number of uh, different environments trying to um, provide that uh, also important uh, immediate response to when there's uh, trauma. And they are also important translators of research. So they take that uh, violence prevention research that so many people are doing, including myself, and work to translate that into practice. So that is, um, the, they're the go-between between, between the, uh, um, the research and the patient. So, uh, so anyway, so that's, that's uh, my response to that question. So let's uh, keep going. So we have a question um, for the, uh, all the panelists. Um, and then after this, I think we can go ahead and take um, Q&A. From everybody, so just to bear with us, and I'll have the panelists sort of keep their responses, you know, relatively brief um, to this. But essentially, where do you see the future of violence prevention research? Uh, let's start you with you, Dr. Hines. Thank you. Well, where I, I think my last response um, indicated where I would like to see the future of violence prevention research go, which is to to get into our our younger age groups, because I do think that that's where we're going to be most effective is, is catching people while they're young in, in violence prevention. Um, I am seeing a lot of pretty exciting work um, focusing on violence prevention, thinking more flexibly about gender and sexual orientation. Um, and so working with um, groups to, to understand that um, you know, sex, sexual assault, intimate partner violence, and so forth is not is not confined to to men abusing women, but that we do see it um, perpetrated by other genders and within other relationships. And so, um, I've been seeing quite a bit of work developing interventions to help more marginalized groups based on gender identity and sexual orientation. Um, because they, you know, traditionally, if you are um, a woman being abused by a, a woman or uh, a man being abused by anyone or somebody who does not identify with um, the gender binary, when you're, what, what I've seen is when they're sexually assaulted or the victims of partner violence, they really have a tough time putting a label on that. Um, and so I have been seeing a lot of effort to, to help members of these communities sort of understand that this is 
this is sexual assault. This is intimate partner violence. You don't deserve it. There are services available to you. Um, and so um, in the effort to keep this short, I will end there um, so that we do have enough time for questions. But I, I am, like I said, I've been seeing some really exciting work in that area. Wonderful. And what about you, Dr. Grace? Yeah, so um, in, in the area of reproductive coercion, it's still, it's still such a new um, area of research um, and practice as well. Um, so the things that are sort of being looked at in terms of prevention in reproductive coercion are um, mostly like clinic level interventions. So training providers to do universal screening, to provide trauma-informed care. Um, there are people developing like scripts for providers to use um, with patients. Um, as I mentioned, I'm really interested in the strategies that people are currently using to preserve their reproductive autonomy when they're experiencing reproductive coercion. So those less detectable methods of birth control and abortion and kind of evaluating the, the safety and the effectiveness of these. I'm currently um, seeking some funding to, to look at that because I really suspect that there might be um, some real safety concerns with, um, with some of those recommendations. Um, at, at the same time, we don't necessarily have um, a better option right now. And so harm reduction is kind of the best tool at our disposal. But, you know, if we know that we know that reproductive coercion is a form of intimate partner violence and people who use reproductive coercion behaviors um, have the same sort of goals as people who use physical violence and emotional violence, which is that goal of power and control. Um, so here's my concern that if someone is trying to um, exert power and control over a partner and it's not working because that person is sort of using a covert method of contraception, um, is it possible that that partner will kind of escalate to physical violence over time? Um, so, so that's kind of what I'm, what I'm uh, trying to, to do with my own research. Um, all of these things that I'm talking about in terms of violence prevention are really secondary prevention. I think a lot of us have talked about methods of secondary prevention, not primary prevention, um, which for me is a, a little bit dissatisfying um, in terms of looking at these as options for safety. Um, I really am excited about some of the ideas that are out there in terms of primary prevention, looking at intimate partner violence in terms of um, uh, efforts to kind of change and challenge gender norms. Some of the other folks on this panel I know are familiar with the um, Coaching Boys Into Men um, program, which is an intervention working with um, high school and middle school athletic coaches, um, kind of helping them to implement a training curriculum with their, um, their athletes, their student athletes, to really sort of shift um, harmful gender norms and social norms. So I think that is just like a super exciting um, program that really leverages the power of sports um, and the authority of coaches and the position of coaches as well. So um, to me, that um, primary prevention is, is hopefully where I think the future of, of violence prevention will go. Ooh, that's exciting, sports. I didn't think about that, that's great. Um, Dr. Jumka Gutta, do you what are your thoughts on the future of violence prevention research? Yeah, so I think similar to Dr. Hines, I think I kind of alluded to that in my response to the last question, but I think, um, you know, along the themes of primary prevention, um, you know, looking at what has, what has shown reductions in intimate partner violence, like what are the models out there that have addressed um, harmful social and gender norms, especially in the global South, and really understanding, you know, adaptation and implementation science research and how they can be used in other populations. And, you know, sometimes that cannot. And, you know, why? Uh, I think also, um, you know, some, you know, policy type questions, like, for instance, especially in um, immigrant communities that I often work with, there might be certain immigration policies that, don't really have something to do with partner violence directly, but it has implications because, you know, all of a sudden 
there's fear. Um, so there might be less trust in services. So how do immigrant friendly policies, how do they trickle down to uh, violence prevention and seeking services is another question I have. And um, also I think um, more broadly is, um, you know, Dr. Grace's comments about, um, you know, forced sterilization and those types of things really got me thinking about some of my work on um, IPV and um, women and girls with disabilities uh, because um, they do face a lot of vulnerability to partner violence and, you know, thinking through interventions and how to be inclusive of disabled populations to ensure that they're also benefiting from breakthroughs and interventions as well. So. Excellent. Um, I myself, I since I do focus on secondary prevention, I, I do think technology has advanced in, in providing us tools, um, not just physical tools such as the light sources and, and things that I work with, but also artificial intelligence tools to um, help address a lot of the disparities that we see um, in terms of, um, uh, you know, making sure trauma is uh, properly documented and um, uh, identified and treated um, equitably across um, various uh, types of various groups, um, whether or not it's we're talking about um, racial groups or disabilities or LGBTQ. Um, I think technology can be a major uh, factor in how we're able to um, you know, address these issues. I contributed to um, recommendations for the uh, Violence Against Women um, reauthorization. And one of the areas that they focused funding on was technology to um, address uh, uh, disparities in um, injury assessment. Um, and so that's, I was excited to see that being um, given a lot of attention because I definitely see that clinically as a huge issue. So. Anyway, I'm gonna wrap that up. Um, so we had, um, that's essentially the uh, ending of our questions that we had prepared. So we would love to open up the floor to you all um, to be able to uh, um, you know, answer your questions that you might have. I'm gonna figure out how to stop sharing there, yeah. So if, if for those of you guys who had your hands raised and were holding on to that crucial question, now is the time. We would love to hear from you. Um, so I didn't know uh, who, what, somebody was helping us out with these questions. That would be me. Oh, Tiffany, yes, hi. Any questions that you- No, would... nothing as yet. Nothing as yet. Oh, I know somebody, a couple of people had their hands raised. You guys wanna raise your hands again? We can unmute you and you can ask us your question if you'd like. And uh, in the uh, interim, as you're, as you're thinking about that, um, does our panel have anything else they wanna share? Because we do have a few minutes. So it's exciting that we have so many people in this college that are doing research um, as it relates to violence um, from different perspectives and uh, you know, for different levels of prevention. Um, you know, I think ideally we would all love to address this from a primary prevention standpoint. And uh, that is the, the dream, like uh, Dr. Grace was saying. <laughs> um, and we can be successful in some areas with that, but um, we definitely need, still need the uh, secondary and tertiary prevention is, is, is also just as important. So, um, all right, any other questions? Now's your chance. For I was gonna here. say, since you're, uh, opening up to this as well. I, I, I do think your point about the technology um, is important for all levels of prevention, mm -hmm. primary, secondary, and tertiary, because, you know, more and more we, we rely on technology. And so we're seeing, you know, the use of social media and apps and all sorts of things to help with uh, all levels of violence prevention. And I think um, the more we can integrate technology into our prevention efforts, the better, uh, the better prevention we'll have. I just got off of a panel, I just got off of a research uh, presentation where they were comparing, um, they were looking at sexual assaults that result from dating apps. 
Mm -hmm. And comparing those to acquaintance rape cases and the differences um, in terms of the characteristics of the patients and the, um, the assaults and that kind of thing, it was, it was fascinating. So yeah. um, we do have a question um, from the audience. So as professionals working in research focused on violence, how do you manage secondary trauma and self-care while doing this work? Ooh, mm -hmm. That's a great question. Yeah, that's a great question. Who wants to try that? Sure. Yeah, I can start. I think that's a really important question. I think um, a lot of students who work with me know that when I first, when we first speak, I will ask what you do for fun, because I want to make sure that there is something else out there. Because as I learned very much the hard way as a doctoral student, um, you know, I was analyzing qualitative interviews of sex trafficking survivors when I was home alone every night. And that was not the way to go when it comes to this kind of work. So I think um, really, you know, learning how to compartmentalize, you know, finding community in other, with other researchers who are doing this kind of work and just really seeking community you know, even outside of the violence space. I mean, um, if there's ever an interesting documentary and I might have friends or colleagues who will say, oh, you might find this interesting. You want to go see it? I'm like, no, don't want to see it. You know, I, that's not what I do in my um, free time. So, um, and also I think um, what also really helps is, you know, partnering with community organizations who are actually doing the work. So sometimes you can see change happening at the local level, even at the most incremental level is important as well. <laughs> yeah, I'm really not good at what you just said, like saying, no, I, I don't wanna do that with my free time because <laughs> I really like find this stuff really interesting. And so like, if I'm gonna decompress by watching TV, I usually am watching some like, you know, mass murderer people <laughs> magazine like show <laughs> or something and and just kind of immersing myself in it still, which is terrible. But um, but I do, I really try to um uh you know, if I so like I, I'm currently on the sitting on the Maryland Maternal Mortality Review Committee and we review cases of maternal mortality and I really have found that I need to sort of block some time beforehand and some time afterwards to um, just sort of decompress. Um, and I also try to get massages once a month. Ooh, I like that recommendation. <laughs> Highly recommend, yes. <laughs> that was a great question. Um, and if anybody else has any questions, we'd be happy to answer them. Um, and uh, let's see, anybody? Anybody else have any good, we had, I'm sure people had some questions about our specific research or um, questions about public health uh, violence research. Love to go ahead and answer those for you. Um, and if, if, does the uh, panel have anything else to add? In terms of- I think I can add something just, um... You know, I think we can probably easily go for another hour if we wanted to, but we're not. But um, but I think that, um, you know, one thing that I just find really interesting about doing this kind of work is that, um, you know, I think less so than, you know, maybe a decade ago, but still is when I'm talking about this work is I'm, I'm often asked um, by an audience member or others like, oh, how did you get interested in this? Is this a personal issue? And, um, you know, I'm kind of still taken aback by that because, you know, my parting line is usually, you know, this is a personal issue for everyone, whether we realize it or not, because it is so hidden, it is so stigmatized, and it is common. So whether we realize it or not, it is a family member, a friend, somebody is experiencing this and it's a, it affects the entire community. It affects public health. So it's a personal issue for all of us, whether we realize it or not. That is a great point. We all know somebody who's experienced violence, whether we know it or not, we just know the person and it can affect people at all socioeconomic levels, all races and religions, uh, all backgrounds. Um, and so it, it's important as a public for us to come to grips with the fact that this is affecting everybody. So that's a great point. 
Excellent. I think that point of, you know, people, even if you don't know, because victims are very, very careful about who they tell. Um, and if they know you're safe, they'll tell you. And it's, it's really interesting that they'll, that they really do scan the environment of who's going to believe me, who's, who can I trust, who's not going to ask victim blaming questions. Um, and so you, you know them even if you don't know, even if you don't know them. Absolutely. Well, it is four o'clock. And so I think we are wrapping up here. Um, if anybody has any follow-up questions about our research or um, about violence prevention research in general, uh, you can, of course, find our contact information on the college's website and looking for our profiles. I am sure we got more information there. You can learn about what we do. So thank you all so much for joining us. We really appreciate uh, you all sticking around. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.